In 1883, a racetrack opened in northern Kentucky. Its founders named it Latonia. Prominent horses raced at Latonia. Renowned jockeys, too, including the famous Eddie Arcaro. But the Great Depression defeated the grand old track, and it closed its doors in 1939. For two decades, the call to the post was silent in northern Kentucky. In July 1956, Matt Wynn Williamson vowed to bring racing back. He and his investors put up a quarter million dollars to buy land along Price Pike in Florence, Kentucky. They would build a new track, and they too would call it Latonia. Architect William Burke of Albuquerque drew up the plans, and work on the new track began in November. Construction was slow for the first two years, but Williamson raised new cash in 1959, launching a building frenzy. Crews worked round the clock getting ready for opening day. In fact, they worked right up to post time, 2 p.m. August 27, 1959. Built for the future, inspired by the past, wrote one reporter, and the Post and Time star shouted, Latonia, great name in racing, is back. And so was the crowd. They packed the grandstand, 11,117 fans on opening day, with Governor Happy Chandler in a front row seat. The track gave away souvenir glasses, and to a lucky few, diamonds. We came through the gate, and they had barrels set up inside the gate. We just walked in, picked a little envelope out, and uh, when I opened the envelope, it said it was from Camp Jewelers in Cincinnati, and that I was a lucky winner of a ring. I just have to pick the right one out. 35 days later, the first meet was in the books. And while the future was by no means assured, by the mid-1960s, Latonia had become a dependable workaday track. In 1971, John Battaglia stepped in as general manager, bringing with him new energy and the conviction that Latonia could be more than it was. He envisioned a race that would put Latonia smack in the hunt for racing's holy grail, the Kentucky Derby. He called it the Spiral Stakes. My father was really a man of vision. I, like I said, I worked here, but uh, my father was Turfway Park. He had the vision that we were gonna have a big race here for a three-year-old, a Kentucky Derby prep, which nobody, no, including myself, believed that we were gonna have a Kentucky Derby prep. It wasn't going to happen, but he, he had the idea that, oh, you know, if we have the race at the right time of the year, if uh, we space the, the races right, they can come in here early to Kentucky, they can run here, they can go to Keeneland and run the bluegrass, then they can run to the Kentucky Derby. Yes. Sure, you know, and it was his idea to call it the spiral because the races spiraled upward toward the Kentucky Derby. That was, uh, that was his vision. In 1982, bourbon maker Jim Beam signed on as a sponsor and the purse jumped to $150,000. Across the country, horsemen paid attention. The very next year, trainer D. Wayne Lucas shipped in a fast and famously bad-tempered horse named Marfa putting the race on the national map. Here we are, it's only 1983, we've only had this race for, you know, a, a few years, really not that many, and here we had the favorite for the Kentucky Derby come out of the, uh, the Jim Beam. After Marfa's win, top horses shipped in regularly. Summer Squall, the Preakness winner in 1990. Hansel, who won the Preakness, the Belmont, and was champion three-year-old for 1991. Lil E.T who spiraled up to win the Kentucky Derby in 1992. Prairie Bayou, who won the Preakness in 1993, became the Beans' second champion three-year-old. And the spectacular Philly Serena Song, who beat the boys in 95 and later piled up nine grade one wins. Latonia's most famous race evolved into the place to see and be seen in Northern Kentucky each spring with special charity events leading up to race day. Well, there's always the first Saturday in May, which is the Derby, but there was always that fourth Saturday in March, and it was the Beam. You had to be here for the Beam. There would be cars lined up for miles, and people would walk across the fields to come. Today, John Battaglia's vision is the $500,000 Lanes End Stakes, sponsored by Lanes End Farm since 2002 and top horses still start their Triple Crown hunt right here. 
horses such as Perfect Drift, Flower Alley, and Hardspun. When Jerry Carroll and his partners bought the track in 1986, Latonia became Turfway Park. Carroll invested in the future, remodeling the clubhouse, opening the race book, and launching the Kentucky Cup Day of Champions. He nearly tripled his investment when he sold the track in 1999 to a group that includes Turfway's current owners, the Keeneland Association and Harris Entertainment. Though much has changed at the track over the past 50 years, two fundamental characteristics remain steadfast. One is a commitment to innovation. On the last day of the winter meet in 1969, Latonia became the first Kentucky track to race at night. And when women began to break into racing as jockeys in the 70s and 80s, they were welcome at Latonia. Like I remember sitting in the gate um, when I first started riding, I was real nervous and I, I wasn't really sure where to put my hands. And uh, Tony Marino, who's not with us anymore, but he was beside me, he said, relax, baby, you're fine, but do put your goggles down. Because I had forgot to take my goggles from my helmet and put them on my face. And they, oh, thank you, thank you. And on September 7th, 2005, when it became the first track in North America to race on the all-weather surface called Polytrack, the multi-million dollar investment in Polytrack, a mix of natural and synthetic materials, has made racing at Turfway safer for both horses and riders. The second characteristic that sets Turfway apart is a remarkable sense of community. Trainer Buff Bradley knows that's true. Whether his multi-millionaire gelding Brass Hat races at Turfway or halfway around the world. Brass Hat is a big fan of Turfway Park. I know that every time that he ships out and then when he comes back, everybody talks about how well he ran and how, where they were in the grandstand and how the grandstand's coming down every time he runs. And though fiercely competitive during races, jockeys find community too. My mother passed away in 1989 and then my father moved down here to be by me. So I would pick him up and bring him to the races every night. And Turfway became a second family. He would love to come in here before the races. He'd read his program, have a cup of coffee, and love talking to all the jockeys, the valets. And uh, like I said, they became like a second family to him. So he loved being here. And racing fans? They're among friends at Turfway, no matter if they're veterans of the game or new fans who gather on Dollar Fridays. It's an everybody-knows-your-name kind of place, where the wisdom of playing horses is handed down, and friendship is as much a part of the game as a winning ticket. Growing up in the household of a professional horse handicapper, um, you know, it's, this was my dad's office. Probably the, uh, the greatest day in my dad's life was the day that uh, Turfway was kind enough to, uh, to honor him. It was a special day. There were probably a good 150, 200 people here to uh, just remember just coming here, all my dad's friends, just spending time here at the track. 50 years of incredible memories. I get goosebumps just watching that when I think of Serena's song and I think of that dead heat with Wild Rush and Silver Charm. Uh, it, it's a source of great pride for us at Turfway Park to see all those wonderful memories. But what is also a source of pride for us are the people who made it possible. The horsemen who've raced their horses with us. The patrons who come out every single night, even if it's 20 below zero. Uh, and you, our community, the folks who've supported us for all those 50 years. Uh, we're not done. Yes, we've looked back on 50 years and we've celebrated that, but we got a lot more to celebrate. And we know that because uh, you're going to be part of it with us. So we'll see you in 50 years with some incredible memories over that same time.